Lord, we just pray that you would give us a wonderful night time in your word. Open uh, our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Lord, we pray as we open the book of Ezra that we will hear from heaven. And we look forward to what you have for us tonight in your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if somebody can grab those lights back there, we're going to be in Ezra chapter 1. Uh, as you turn there, you may want to also put your finger in uh, the book of Daniel, or put something in the book of Daniel, maybe a piece of paper or something, and because we're going we're gonna to cross-reference a lot. Um, Ezra is written um, uh, at a very interesting point in history. Uh, the book of Ezra takes place when Cyrus begins to reign in Persia. And that's time-stamped in Daniel. And some of what Daniel goes through ties into what we see in Ezra. God's people had been living on the land, and they'd been told that, every, uh, <clears throat> that they needed to give the, the land a Sabbath every seven years. And they decided that they would uh, take that as a suggestion and keep working through that seventh year and keep plowing the land. And they did it for 490 years. And the Lord said, you owe the land 70 years of rest. And so you guys are all going to get uprooted and you're going to go to Babylon for 70 years. And then you're going to get brought back to the land after the land has had its Sabbath rest. So the Lord was serious about that. And so after 490 years, he, he sent them there. And we're going to look at that as well. So let's go to Ezra. And so Ezra takes place kind of at the end of Daniel's ministry because Daniel's an old man and as Cyrus and Darius come in and the theme of it is really the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra establishes them back to the covenant and to their covenant God and Nehemiah helps build the wall and the structure around the city and then of course he gets Ezra to come in and, and, and read the law but Nehemiah, his role is more to organize the people to stand up against evil, all right? And to that end, <clears throat> I want to let you know, uh, that's a homophone, no, right? K-N-O-W and N-O. I want you to know that we're saying no to issue one. We're going to protect children and we're going to protect parents' rights, okay? So we are praying for that Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock. Uh, these signs, we've had a number of people bring signs in. Stephanie brought some in tonight. You can grab one on your way out, put it on your yard, all right? And uh, every time you see it, you can pray over it. You can talk to people about issue one, <clears throat> and you can come pray on Sunday mornings. Uh, we are kind of the tip of the spear, Ohio. Uh, if this issue um, with uh, issue one passes here, as we had that presentation a few weekends ago, it's likely going to pass in other states. So we would like to see abortion uh, eliminated, but at least drastically limited. And we want parents to have rights, which in many places they do not. You know, <clears throat> 20 years ago, they were talking about something called cognitive abuse. I don't know if you ever heard that term. And that was at the UN. And they were discussing if religious training is cognitive abuse. And the UN and some of those thinkers kind of came... Now, of course, what they do is they take, like, the, you know, Islam, and if you do read their original sources, jihad is all throughout their original sources. You can't... It's not a religion of peace. Just read the Quran. Read the Hadith. It's not a religion of peace. So they kind of take the extreme, and then they say, well, if your child consents, right? So even... In 2014, when we were doing foster to adopt training in Ontario, Canada, we were told by them, if you can't take someone to church who's living under your roof, unless they consent to it, they may be eight years old, but they've got to consent. So <clears throat> parents' rights on an international scale in the West are getting eroded constantly, all right? And cognitive abuse is really the the issue that it will be illegal at some point to teach your kids religious instruction or values. Which is why you should read Eric Metaxas's book, If You Can Keep It, 
because that will help you understand the deeply woven, fundamental, religious, Protestant beliefs that were part of the fabric of this nation. All right? So uh, we're going to have book club at the end of the month. I'd encourage you to grab a copy and read it. Uh, I'm reading it for the, oh Lord, how many times? I'm reading it again this week, and I've read it so many times. So I'm going to tell you, it's a good book. But I want you to vote no. I want you to vote your conscience, which should be no, and also grab a sign if you like. All right. Uh, that, that shameless promotion is over. Okay, so let's go to Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to read when this happened. This is now in the first year of King Cy of Cyrus, king of Persia. Okay, so now we know when that is. Let's go to Daniel 5. All right, Daniel 5, famous passage. Belteshazzar is throwing a party, all right? He is, uh, <clears throat> his, he's co-regent. His father, Nanapalazar, is off at war, the big guy, and the son is having a drunken brawl party for days on end, right? Always watch politicians' children. And he's out of control. And, uh, and, and they're so drunk that the Medes and the Persians dam up the river that ran through the city and walk in on dry land, infiltrate and take over. This is that famous writing, handwriting on the wall that, that he uh, did not know what that was. And it's many, many Tekel Yufarsin. And the explanation, which is given at the end of the chapter by Daniel, is this. Now the inscription was written out, and I'm in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 5. Many, many Tekel Yufarsin. This is the interpretation of the message. So not only did he not know what the message said, he didn't know what it meant. And there was, of course, a hand that appeared on the wall and wrote it which he must have thought, I think I've had too much to drink. Okay, that had to be a bizarre moment. And this is where we get the phrase in English, the handwriting is on the wall, which means you're about to be removed or it's over. The interpretation of the message is many. God has numbered your kingdom and put it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient or found wanting. Okay, so they've looked at you and said, it's over. And Perez, the kingdom shall be divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Now Belshazzar gave orders that they clothe Daniel with the purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issue a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as third ruler of the kingdom. Why third ruler? Because he was co-regent, right? It was his dad, Belshazzar, and then now Daniel. That same night, Belshazzar, uh, the... the uh, <clears throat> the king was slain. The Chaldean king was slain. So Darius the Mede, and of course Cyrus with him, received the kingdom at about the age of 62. And that wraps up Daniel chapter 5. And we get into chapter 6, the lion's den. You've got laws of the Medes and the Persians. That's why Daniel goes to the lion's den. And it's Darius who, who does that. And it's because they're working together as a coalition. The Medes and the Persians are working together. Cyrus is the king of the Persians. So that's what happened, is <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar's great-grandson sees the kingdom completely crumble and get handed over to the Medes and the Persians. All right, so now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. All right, so let's, um, let's, if you're in Ezra 1, just turn the page over to 2 Chronicles chapter tw uh, 36, verses 22 through 23. Now, 2 Chronicles, this takes place in uh, 538, which is when he took over. And it says there, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah... The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Oh boy, that sounds exactly look just like verse 1 of Ezra. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build a house, build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among all his people, may the Lord... His God be with him and let him go up. 
All right. So this is uh, documented in the Chronicles. 538 BC, this happens. And almost the same verse is in verse 2. And what's interesting is, this is exactly what happened. Now, if we go to Jeremiah, we can read a few things, which I think is important that we get some, some background. Remember Daniel was reading in Jeremiah in chapter 9, and he started to repent and said, Lord, we have sinned. You're gracious. And he was asking the Lord to send them back and rebuild the temple and rebuild the glory of God. So let's go to Jeremiah 25. And I'm going to read a few, uh, one verse out of 25, and then I'm going to go to 29 and read a very familiar verse to you, all right? And in chapter uh, uh, 25, I'm going to read verse 12. Then it will be when 70 years are complete, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in, take him for 70 years, and then at 70 years, they're done, and that's exactly what happened. And Jeremiah 29, starting with verse 10, thus declares the Lord, when 70 years have been complete, completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to bring you back to this place. So they're told, you're going to go into captivity, but when 70 years are over, you're coming back. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. That kind of sounds like everybody's life verse. Well, that's actually in the context of being going, going into captivity, and the Lord's going to get him out of captivity. Then you, will, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I'll restore your fortunes, will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back to this place where I sent you into exile. So in those verses, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10 through 14, and Jeremiah 25, verse 12, he very clearly says it's going to be 70 years in Babylon. You're going to be driven into captivity. I'm going to bring you back to this land, and I'm going to restore you, and you're going to be restored spiritually because you're going to call on me, and I'll answer. So there's got to be a spiritual restoration. And there's got to be a, a restoration to the land. So if we go back to Ezra, it says in verse 2, Then thus says, king of, uh, says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of this earth and has appointed me to build a house, uh, him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judea, or in Judah. Okay, so let's go to Isaiah. All right, Isaiah 44. What's interesting about Isaiah 44, and this is also in uh, the Jewish uh, historical writings, Josephus mentions this, and you can pick up a copy of his uh, works translated into English, and they're very interesting to read. He wrote Antiquities and the Wars of the Jews. Um, he's writing for the Romans, so it's got a bit of a Roman slant, but it is interesting Jewish history. So go to Isaiah chapter 44, and... Um, I'm going to read a little bit here. All right, verse 26. It says, Confirming his, the word of his servant, performing his purpose and his messenger. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. And to the cities of Judah, they shall be built. I will raise up her ruins again. So this is around 740, probably 730 B.C. There were no ruins. This would be like if somebody said, we're going to erect two twin towers. And they were writing it in 1980. And you say, but they're there. Why do we need to erect them when they're already there? And they said, well, they're going to get destroyed. And then we're going to rebuild them. So why are they rebuilding the ruins? Because there are ruins, and there weren't ruins until Babylon destroyed them in the three waves of Nebuchadnezzar. It is I who says of the deep sea, be dried up. I will make the rivers dry. Now that's speaking directly of when the, they were dried up and the Medes and the Persians walked into Babylon, right? Because it was completely impregnable. It had running water going through the city. So they were good. And it was such a large city, they had all kinds of agriculture right in the city. They could lock the gates and have plenty of food and they had everything they needed. But the Lord says he dried up the rivers and the Medes and the Persians went in. It is I who says of Cyrus. Okay. So this is 
at least 100 years before he was born. At least. So you have to, believe, you have to ask yourself, how did, how did Isaiah know this name? He is my shepherd. That's a Gentile king. And he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Now, what Josephus says is that when Cyrus came into Babylon, a very wise and elderly man in his 80s named Daniel came up to Cyrus and said, I have to share something with you. You're in our scriptures. And he brought him to this passage and read his name and read of the events that God said were going to happen, that literally happened. And if you read on, it says, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I've taken by my right hand to subdue nations before him. Okay, he mentioned that in uh, verse 2 in Ezra and also in Second Chronicles 36. And now Cyrus, when he hears this, realizes, oh, God did it. God did it? Oh, God did it. God did it. To loose the loins of kings, if you read chapter 5 carefully, you'll realize the physical reaction that happened to Belshazzar. And his loins were loosed. And you can let your mind fill in the details. To open the doors before him and gates that will not be shut. And again, he would have known that. Because those gates were always impregnable. I will go before you to make the rough places smooth and shatter the doors of bronze and cut through the iron bars. I will give you the treasure of darkness and hidden wealth of the secret place, which literally God did to Cyrus when he got to Babylon, so that you will know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. And those are the verses that Josephus writes out of history, it's not in the Bible, but it's history, that Daniel read to Cyrus. Now, you got to ask yourself. So, either there were multiple Isaiahs and somebody wrote after the events and it's history, or what has been always accepted is that there was one Isaiah and that this is prophecy that came literally fulfilled. And so all these scholars were like, there has to be two Isaiahs. We don't believe this. In the 1800s, the higher criticism movement, you can't trust the Bible. Isaiah isn't really, it is multiple Isaiahs. That's how he knew he could prophesy the way he did. And then some kid was watching goats near the Dead Sea and he threw a rock because he's bored. He's a guy into a cavern and he heard something shatter. And he climbed up there and realized there's all of the scrolls. And they got removed from the Dead Sea area of Jordan. They got whisked into Israel. And a shrewd Jewish businessman, that may be hard for some of you to picture, got them to America. Got them out of the Middle East. And you know what they found in those? Some of you know where I'm going with this. They found in one of the containers a whole scroll of Isaiah. They call it the Golden Scroll. And it's on display right now in Jerusalem. The whole thing. That's why some of the Ashkenazi Jews years ago had removed Isaiah 53 because it sounded too much like Christ. They can't do that anymore because it's right there. They can look at it in Hebrew and realize it's right there. Right? And so this prophecy that Isaiah gives of Cyrus through simple Golden Scroll... One scroll, it's very clear that God told Isaiah in advance to write him down by name. Now, this is the only book that does that, that says this is going to happen. It's exactly how it's going to happen. And then it comes true that way, all right? And that's one of the reasons why you can trust the Bible, is the, the clarity and the prophecy. And we know that Daniel had read Jeremiah... That's why in Daniel 9, he's confessing the sins of his people because he's looking and realizing it's almost 70 years. It's almost time to go home. So he was praying that he, God would send them back. Now, let's keep going. <clears throat> Whoever there is among you of all the peoples 
May his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Now, it's a little clear in the original that he's saying that he is God. He realized that the God of the Jews was, was God. <clears throat> and so he's telling them to go home and rebuild the temple. And what's significant there, or one of the many significant things, is that it was very important that uh, God's people who were in Babylon realized that they may have lived in Babylon, but they were still God's chosen people. Right? That was the subtlety. I don't think we're going to get through chapter 1. But that was the subtlety of what the Nazis did. They said, you're German, you're Christians who are Germans. Right? If you read Hitler's Cross, it's a fascinating book. It talks about how he manipulated the churches. And there were some that stood up. There was a confessing church that stood up. That is correct. Bonhoeffer, Niemöller, or other great men. But the point is, is that he said, you're, you're, you're Germans. Well, you're Christians and you're Germans, right? You're Christians and you're Germans. Yes, we are. We're Christians. And Germans are Christians. Yes, whether it's Catholic or Protestant, we're Christian. We're a Christian nation. I mean, Luther made Germany what it is, the language and everything through the New Testament. Uh, tra translating the Bible, pardon me. And, and what happened was, the subtle switch became, they went from being Christians who were Germans to being Germans who were Christians. And when it was German first and Christian second, that's when they signed on. And there's a picture in Hitler's Cross. It's bone chilling. It's a bunch of pastors standing in front of the Wittenberg door where Luther nailed the 95 Thesis that's launched the Protestant Reformation, even though there were seeds laid by Wycliffe and, and Huss and other men in the 1300s, uh, saluting Hitler with, with the Nazi broken cross, the Hindu symbol, which we call the swastika, right? And Because um, they had Hindu religion through not the Nazism. And they're saluting Hitler in front of that very door. And you go, how'd that happen? Well, because they started to become more German than they were Christians. The people in Babylon started to become more Babylonians than they were Jews. You know that there were Jews living in Iran and Iraq. I mean, in Iran until 1979. Because it was Persia. And it was good times. Like, it was the Paris of the Middle East. And when, when, <clears throat> when faithful Islam took over, not radical, but people who want to follow their teachings... Man, those Jews who were Persians, the Jews, they left and they moved to New York because <laughs> there's such good food in New York. I had a kid today. I was talking about New York City and this kid at school, he's like, is the pizza really good there? And I said, it's really, I said, all the food is really good there, but the pizza is incredible. Anyway, I thought that was the funniest thing. His name was Anthony, so I told him about Billy Joel's Anthony song, you know, who needs a house out in Hackensack? Every time I laugh at that line, if you know Hackensack, you would laugh as well. All right, um, verse 3. All right, so, so we've got to realize that, that they, they are now given freedom to go home. But home has become Babylon to many of them, because not that many are going to leave. Which is absolutely breaks Daniel's heart. Daniel's in his 80s. He's too old to leave at this point. But many will not leave. All right? And uh, let's go to... Um, uh, I'm going to go back to Daniel for a minute. Um, and uh, now, what's interesting is... Um, is... He goes on to verse 4. He says, Every survivor... At whatever place he may live, let the man of that place support him with silver, gold, and goods, and cattle, and a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. All right, so there's a sense that they're going to be helped out. They're going to be given support, not unlike uh, the, um, uh, the <clears throat> Egyptians did when they, the children of Israel left and headed out to the wilderness. They were given lots of gold. And other gifts, which is pretty interesting. Um, they're going to go back and build the temple. And um, if you want to read about the first temple, 
You can go to 1 Kings 8. We're not going to do that. We don't have time. But if you go to 1 Kings 8, you can read it. Solomon's dedication to the first temple. That's a temple that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. They're going to go back and build the second, second temple. That's what they're headed back to do. And that's why they're headed back. They're headed back to build the temple. Now, what's also interesting, and it's just only 11 verses. <clears throat> it says, The heads of the father's household and Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone who's spirit God stirred up and rebuilt the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem now that's mentioned there God's spirit stirred up and it's also mentioned we may have missed it in verse 1 the Lord stirred the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia so there's this sense that God is stirring up the priests and the Levites and he's stirring up Cyrus to send them and to have people help them out and then to send them to go rebuild the house of your God, right? Now you have to remember, Judaism can't function without a temple because it is a sacrificial religion. The old covenant had to have shedding of blood. That's the only way there was remission of sins. An animal is sacrificed. There's no animal sacrifices because there's no temple. So they're in Babylon for 70 years going, what, how do we do this? Because we can't. And now they're given an opportunity to go back and engage in their sacrificial system. And all those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, gold, and with goods and cattle and valuables aside from what had been given as free will offering. So they were given freely things to go, so they could go back and they could rebuild. And so people were helping to finance it, right? It's not unlike how David financed Solomon's building of the temple, right? David couldn't build it because he had blood on his hands. You don't ever think about David, right? You're reading the Psalms or you're reading the life of David. You think, oh, what a, what a nice guy. You know, you picture him as this young 17-year-old with a slingshot, you know, dropping Goliath. We always forget, you know, that he went over and like sliced his head off. Like, like we forget that part, okay? When you're teaching boys Sunday school, you, you cover that because all the boys are like, cool, you know, and walking around carrying a head. You know, all the girls are under the desks wishing that you'd stop talking. You know, I'm just kidding, ladies. But you know, like, like David was a man of war. We don't think about that. So he said, you can't build a temple for me, but your son, the ladies man, I'm just kidding, that, you know, he was missing yeah, some problems. He can build the temple. So then David gave him the gold. So there's always people behind the scenes giving and supplying so they can have the temple. Now, What's interesting is in verse 7, it says here, King Cyrus brought the articles out of the house of the Lord, uh, uh, the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. So let's go to, back to Daniel, because we've got to talk about Nebuchadnezzar again and what he did. And uh, it's a very interesting point. And I'm also going to go to Isaiah, because there's an interesting part in Isaiah that uh, we can tie into this, kind of wrap it all up. All right. Okay, Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, into his hand, pardon me, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. He brought vessels of the treasury of his God. All right. So he took vessels out of the temple and brought them into the treasury of his God. I remember as a kid, we had somebody break into our church and uh, use the offering plate uh, as an ashtray. And I remember I came in, of course, I was a pastor's kid. So I came in and I was looking around and I remember they were like homeless dudes in Florida, right? So they broke in and they were sleeping there and they were smoking and using the offering plate which we have a box, we don't even have a plate here, as an ashtray. And I remember that visual as a child and looking at two things that just don't belong together, right? And you got to think, all these things that were used to glorify God were now in the temple of these pagan 
deities in the Babylonian pagan deities were just disgusting. All right? So that happens, and they existed there for 70 years. Well, a king came from Babylon in uh, Isaiah 39, and Hezekiah in verse 2 of Isaiah 39 was pleased to show him all the treasures of the house, silver and gold and spices and precious oil and the whole army found his treasures. There's nothing in his house or not in all his uh, do, <clears throat> dominion that Hezekiah didn't show them. So Hezekiah gets this kind of group from Babylon and he's like, hey guys, I want you to see all the silver, gold, spices, all the wealth that I've accumulated. What do they say if you win the lottery? Move. Change your name. Don't tell any of your family members, right? Not bad advice. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said, What did these men say? And where have they come from to you? And Hezekiah said, They've come to me from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They've seen all that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasures I haven't shown them. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up to store this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will issue from you and who you will beget will be taken away from you and they'll become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Okay, that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. Like Isaiah prophesies, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't imagine him looking at Hezekiah and thinking, how foolish. God said now that your stuff's going to get carried off and your sons are going to get carried off, which happened in 605. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and truth in my days. So Hezekiah, who God had personally given extra long life to, was foolish enough to show off everything he had, and Nebuchadnezzar came in later and captured it. So it's interesting to tie those together. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had brought them out by the hand of Mirath, the treasurer, and he counted them by Sheik's Bazaar, the prince of Judah. Now this was the number, and so we start to get the number of how many there were. Now, it's interesting because uh, some of these names are also mentioned in Ezra, and this is also repeated in Ezra chapter 5, verse 14. It says, also the gold, the silver utensils from the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar taken to the temple in Jerusalem, were brought to the temple in Babylon. These Cyrus took from the temple in Babylon and were given to, to those whose name was Shishbazar, who had been appointed governor. All right. So he's handling all this stuff over. Now this is their number, 30 gold dishes. A thousand silver dishes, 29 duplicates. It's a kind of an obscure word, probably knives or something. 30 golden bowls, 410 silver bowls of a kind, of a second kind, and a thousand other articles. This is the stuff that Belshazzar and Daniel 5 got from the temple of his god and was using in his party. And God was like, you're done. Okay? The articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. That's how many were taken by, uh, by the Babylonians, which is a lot, right? And there's kind of a... <clears throat> all right? And Shishbazar brought them all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. So Cyrus says, you guys can go back and rebuild your temple. And here's the stuff, which is all very valuable, out of the temple of the God of the Babylonians, which all belongs in your temple. And you take these 5,400 pieces back and you go. Now, it's interesting because only 50,000 people leave. That's it. We'll get that in chapter 2. All right? But for now, I want you to remember that Cyrus, who God calls by name in Isaiah, 
when the 70 years are up prophesied by Jeremiah, comes in and destroys Babylon exactly the way Jeremiah prophesied it. And if, it, if we believe what is written by Josephus, which I do, when Cyrus realized his role, he commissions these people to head back and rebuild the temple. And when he does, he gives them all the goods that was taken from the temple that Hezekiah foolishly, a generation before, showed the Babylonians that Nebuchadnezzar took in 605. So what can we draw out of this as a life lesson? I wrote over the top of my notes that God is entirely and completely sovereign. We exist in a point in time. And we wonder sometimes, why am I going through what I'm going through? What is happening in my life? And then we start to look back and realize all the dots that God's connecting. We really don't understand it very well moving forward. It's a lot easier uh, to look back and see how God went ahead of us and took care of us. I'll never forget. We were in New York State. And we were... And we'll get to questions right after I finish this. And uh, we were crossing to go shopping. And Jen had her green card on her. And in Niagara Falls, they said, we, we're gonna, we want that. We're going to take it. And when you're at the border, you have no rights. Even as a U.S. citizen, you have very few rights. They, they bully you a lot. And I can tell you stories. I remember sometimes saying, I'm a U.S. citizen. They're like... And, and so we had to get her reapplied to come into the United States and she got a visa and so when she went to the border to go through in Buffalo uh, the first time she was denied which was that was that was quite an adventure and uh, and then we came back again and um, and they <clears throat> our, our lawyer was there and they said we're gonna give you six months but then you've got to come back and the guy said with great pomposity and you will have to come to this desk to get another stamp on that visa and we went, okay. And so we moved. I said, all right, Lord, you got to go before us. So I quickly filed all the paperwork. And the minute you start to file the paperwork, and Mike Turner helped us. I always tell people to vote for Mike Turner, whether you like him or not, because he helped me with immigration. And uh, I'm not saying I'm crazy about him, but he helped me. So I like the guy. So his office helped us. And we got the paperwork going. And she had to go through the whole process and pay all the money and all that garbage. And... Uh, then we got to go to the interview. We walk down to we go down to Cincinnati, and you're looking at everybody who may interview you, and you're like, I don't know, that guy looks like, uh, I don't know, I don't know, maybe uh, he, whatever he ate for breakfast is disagreeing with him. That person looks like she's a little angry, and so this guy comes out. He's like, I'll take you back, and he had a heavy accent, a Spanish accent, and so we go and we sit down, and he was. Um, uh, he was from uh, Guatemala. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I pastor a church. I said, but it's really small, so I work on the side. And you know what he did? He looked across the desk and said, in Guatemala, my pastor, he had a job too. And I looked at him and went, we're Christians. Out of everybody I'm looking at, I'm like, who are we going to get? We get some guy who's a Christian. And it was like, whoosh, we're done. The green card comes in the mail. Right? We'd, we'd done everything legally and done everything right and everything was in good shape. But they have a lot of power. And I looked and thought, thank you, Lord. Right? The Lord always goes ahead of you. So some of you are sitting here going, I got this thing coming up. I got a test. I got a surgery. I got... I don't know what's going to happen in the spring with the economy. I'm with you on that one. I'm with you. All right? At work, they keep shutting machines down. And I went to my boss and I said, are you guys concerned about layoffs? I mean, I'm not because I got seniority and Stephen has seniority. I said, are we concerned about layoffs? Oh, no, 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 no. I said, do you guys realize what's happening in the economy and what's going to happen by the spring? No. I said, you guys need to stop hiring, okay? Stop it because you're just going to have to lay them off anyway. So I got concerns about that. But the Lord's going to go ahead of us, right? 
All those captives are sitting in Babylon. One day, it's the Babylonians. Now it's the Medes and the Persians. And very shortly after the Medes and the Persians take over, the Persian king says, hey, you can go home. And they're looking back going, God, if I connect all these prophecies, you said this was going to happen, and it's happening exactly the way you said it. And you start to read the scriptures and go, I don't have to worry, because God's got everything under control, right? And so we just, we need to trust. We need to trust a lot more than we often do. We don't trust like we should, all right? We don't. And, uh, and I'm in there too. I'm probably worse than you guys. Because I'm like, God, I think I can help you with this. It never goes so well. <laughs> so let's trust the Lord. On this thing, why are we praying Sunday morning? Because we're going to tell the Lord we're going to trust him. Okay? Put one on your lawn. Tell your neighbors. This is not a partisan issue. This is a, a, an issue of parental and children protection. All right? And, uh, and we pray and we trust the Lord. And the Lord's going to go ahead of us. All right, so those, those are those 11 verses. Um, as you look at chapter 2, obviously there's a massive census. So we're going to probably combine 2 and 3 together. Uh, unless you want me to, to um, struggle through all the Hebrew names, which I'll be willing to do that. I, t I asked uh, some of the kids to read today and um, they opened the scriptures and they're like, it was in uh, Acts 17.1, and it mentions these Greek names. And they're like, how do I say that? And I said, loudly and with great confidence. That's how you say it. <laughs> and they laughed. All right, let's pray, and then we can go to questions. Lord, we thank you so much for your sovereignty and how you laid all this plan out ahead of time and how you directed your people to go home. And you did that um, to, uh, to, to get... Uh, Get everything assembled the way you had it laid out. And we love you, Lord. And we know we can trust your sovereignty. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So what questions do we have? I love you guys are spread out. It's like... And the way the chairs are with the school kids. It's a little... Any questions? Yes, Joel. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Hezekiah is an interesting study because he's a good king. He asks for more years and he gets more years. And you're right. He does not raise his son well. And in those extra years, he shows off all the things of the temple to the Babylonians. And that was very foolish, right? And um, I, I think it's interesting because we long for, um, <clears throat> you know, the people <clears throat> that we look up to to almost be perfect. And like we look up to Peter through the New Testament, such a powerful, powerful proclamations of the gospel, especially after the resurrection. But then you go to Galatians and he's not eating with Gentiles and Paul has to confront him to his face. You know what I'm saying? And I think one of the interesting things is, <clears throat> Joel, is that Hezekiah just shows us how God is sovereign because all of that things that needed to happen with Babylon and everything, Hezekiah helped f facilitate that, even though it was foolish. And yet he also raised a son that created further problems because of the way he raised him. And, and God was overseeing all of it. And so it is, it's interesting. I tell people one of the reasons I believe the Bible is because the people who wrote it present 
their faults. Clearly. Right? And so Isaiah is just writing what happened. Hezekiah gets extra years. You think, this is really good news. He gets 15 more years. And then in his 15 more years, he shows the Babylonians all the treasures. Really bad move. Right? And, uh, and, and, and you see this through the whole scriptures. And I go, it helps me understand it. It also helps me relate to people. Right? So, but that's, yeah, that's interesting that you point that out. Because God in his sovereignty extended his life and then Hezekiah did something foolish. And God who has a way of taking really horrible things and working them out for good, Romans 8, 28, took that, allowed Babylon to come in, take those things out of the temple, allowed his people to go to Babylon for 70 years because they loved idols. And then they came back home and were like, we're never getting involved with idols again. And they were done. They were cured of their idolatry after the 70 years in Babylon. Uh, I mean, they did other stuff that didn't go so well, but they were cured at least of their idolatry. So you can see God's hand in all that. But yeah, it's interesting. Hezekiah is an interesting king. And the thing is, is when you look at good kings, they all had faults, right? I mean, you look through the scriptures and everybody, you look and go, they're just feet are made of clay, you know? So... That's why I've always said, if you want to write a parenting book, write it, have it published probably 40 years after you're dead, okay? People who write parenting books are like, I know how to parent, and they're, and I love it too. No disrespect to millennials, but they're like, I got a parenting blog, and I want to tell you how to parent. How old is your child? Four. I'm like, yeah, no thanks. Okay, I'll take a pass, all right? Like, I want to talk to somebody who's got grandchildren and who's done very well with their kids and very well with their grandchildren, who's a lot older than I am, to give me advice, right? Sometimes we give advice in an echo chamber among our own demographic. I, I, I don't want that. I want people who are older than I am to give me wisdom. Anyway, but yeah, that's a good point, Joel. Thank you. And these days it's getting harder to find people older than I am, to be quite frank. <laughs> You know, when you do your age on, the, on something and you're like, you're scrolling down, you're like, man, I got to get to my age year. Oh my gosh, I'm getting exhausted trying to find it. Anyway, my birth year. Any other questions? Any other comments? All right, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you for what you're doing in each one of our lives. We know, Lord, you are good and you're gracious and kind. Uh, we, we leave these truths in your hands. We ask for your grace and your mercy, and we ask that you would continue to draw us close to you. And Lord, we ask that uh, as we look at all these prophecies that are fulfilled, that we would further trust in your word that it is sufficient, Lord, and it's authoritative. And may our lives be conformed to it, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.